This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Hi, curious minds out there in our ever-expanding radio land. Welcome to CC with BB. Connecting with Coincidence with Dr. Bernie Beitman, M.D., the only radio show in the world dedicated to the study of coincidences, synchronicity, and serendipity. We are coming to you through the X-Zone Broadcast Network, located in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and broadcasting all over the world. I am a psychiatrist. I am building on the work of psychiatrist Carl Jung by making synchronicity awareness more practical building on his theoretical work. Meaningful coincidences can provide a new path for spiritual development. Synchronicities, otherwise known as meaningful coincidences, involve both the individual mind and the surroundings. Like meditation, it brings awareness of the interconnectedness of all things. Synchronicity adds details about the relationship of the individual to that unity. Synchronicity offers clues to how that unity works. For example, coincidences sometimes seem to represent signals from another intelligence calling our attention to its existence. The phrase connecting with coincidence is my coincidence brand. It is the name of my book, my Psychology Today blog, and my website, as well as my social media sites. Be sure to visit my YouTube channel, too, and you'll find their Dr. Coincidence. To find any and all of them, please put Connecting with Coincidence in your search engine. Would you like to know how sensitive to coincidences you are? Take the Weird Coincidence survey on my website. Coincidences can help with the practical, emotional, and spiritual in your life. They let us know we have abilities like telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, and human GPS. By human GPS, I mean our ability to get to places we need to go without consciously intending to go there. Coincidences point us towards other intelligences that may be influencing our lives, and they sometimes trick us. Synchronicities offer a path towards spiritual development. Our minds function in our mental atmosphere, the psychosphere. Just as we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide, we also inspire energy information and send out energy information. The scaffolding of the psychosphere is being strengthened by the rapid development of of the Internet. This scaffolding provides support for our psi abilities like telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition. Our guest today is Michael Jower. Michael has studied animals and people. And I'm going to tell Michael a story as he's listening in, or two, about a couple of dogs I know. One is named Walter. Walter is the favorite son of my younger son, uh, Carlin. Walter is not really a dog, uh, according to Walter, and according to Carlin and me. He's something else. And I was just in Denver visiting uh, Carlin and Walter and friends. And I love Walter, and Walter loves me. I, I talked to him on, face, on, uh, on FaceTime, uh, and he seems to listen. And finally, I got to see him again, because I hadn't for a while. And as I was leaving to come back to Charlottesville, Virginia, Walter looked right at me as I looked back towards him, and there was a tug in my heart, a tug in my heart that made me not want to leave. He was just looking at me. No one could tell anything, but he was attached to me and was trying to say, don't leave me. 
Now, Carlin has told me about how difficult it is for him to leave uh, when he goes to work because Walter does the same thing to him. So Carlin gets comes sometimes comes late to work because Walter is tugging on Carlin's heartstrings just the way Walter did with me. Walter is kind of a replacement in my life for my dog, Snapper, who I lost when I was nine. And when I came home uh, to find him one day uh, from school, he wasn't there. And my mother told me to go to the police station to look for him. Maybe they knew where he was. The big man at the desk uh, told me no. He wasn't, we didn't know where your dog was. Uh, sorry, son. And I walked down the stairs back to the sidewalk where I parked my bike. And instead of going back the way I had come, my tears had filled my eyes. I didn't know what I was doing. I went the wrong way home. And as I pedaled with tears falling from my eyes, kind of not seeing where I was going, I looked up. And there coming towards me was a dog that walked sideways the way Snapper did. It was Snapper. It was him. I am still remember now how, how happy I was, and I'm happy even remembering it now still. There he was. He jumped up on my legs and saying kind of, where were you? And we went home. I took one wrong turn. Snapper had to, to get there. Snapper took four right turns to be able to get back to me. We'll talk about animals and people with our guest, Michael Jower. In our next segment, we'll be back after a short break. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. President of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Is it science or is it magic? Once a magical thing has been scientifically proven, is it no longer magic? Or is magic simply the science of tomorrow? Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, on The Science of Magic, a syndicated radio program dedicated to combining the science and magic of today's dynamic and controversial topics to co-create new solutions. 
by triangulating information from today's leading experts from the scientific and magical fields, we uncover expansive and evolutionary truths you won't find anywhere else. Join us daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, as I interview the share of thoughts with the amazing guests from both science and magic. The resulting knowledge is unprecedented. As a gift to you, the listener, past episodes can be accessed on our website free of charge at thescienceofmagic.net. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soldiers. Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. Oh, welcome back to CC with BB, connecting with coincidence with Dr. Bernie Beitman. That's me. Our guest today is Michael Jower. Michael is a Washington, D.C. based writer, speaker, and res- researcher. His focus is the nexus of personality development, mind, body, emotion, and spirituality. Michael is the lead author of two books, The Spiritual Anatomy of Emotion and Your Emotional Type. But what you need to know most about Michael is how he tunes into emotions and tunes into the hypersensitivity of other people and of animals. He he brings to the study of coincidences and other things the, the ways in which humans and animals communicate with each other and takes them out of the coincidence place and begins to talk about a mechanism. Michael, welcome to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure, Dr. B. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to have you here. Tell us about some of your experiences with animal sensitivities. Uh, just start with uh, any story you'd like. Uh, the the one with Darwin with the, with your cat would be a nice place to start. Sure, sure. Well, um, my cat was named Dalton, and he was the first of several cats that I've owned. Really, thanks to my wife, who uh, was a cat person. She's too allergic these days to to remain a cat person. So we have dogs. But uh, she encouraged me to adopt Dalton, who I refer to as the George Clooney of cats. He was as handsome a devil as uh, ever a cat that walked the earth, completely white. He had one blue eye and one green eye, very suave, debonair. Um, Earlier generation might think of him as a Cary Grant of cats, but I'll update that for, uh, for George Clooney. Anyway... Um, he would go around the neighborhood and uh, really show himself off. And uh, he would disappear uh, sometimes for, for a couple of days. Uh, we used to make up stories about what he was doing. We were su- suggesting, I think it was my wife's idea, that he was a CIA operative. He would uh, sort of disappear and then come back after a couple of days. But um, unlike um, you know the stereotypical cat, um, he was very loving, um, a little bit standoffish to certain people at times, but... About as close a relationship as I can imagine having with an animal uh, myself. And um, when he got uh, up in years, uh, he, you know, he continued on his perambulations. And um, uh, a couple of days went by, and he did not return. Uh, and it was um, it was fall. It was around around this time of year, actually. I guess it was in September. Um, and my daughter was very young at the time. I think she was just about two years old or two and a half at that time. And um, I, I went out looking for him somewhat distressed after I think the third day. I figured something must have must have happened. I went all around the neighborhood, could not find him. Found out uh, a few days later um, 
from a neighbor that uh, the neighbor had seen Dalton. He'd been hit by a car and he referred me to yet another neighbor who said, yes, this happened and was near our property and uh, we sort of disposed of him. So I was obviously very sad about that. I didn't have a chance to say goodbye, anything like that. Um, and uh, the following Saturday morning, um, we were um, on the top floor of our um, two-level home, and it was a beautiful, crisp fall Saturday morning, and I remember we were expecting a, a girl from across the street, a teenager, to come over, and uh, I think she was practicing photography. She was going to do something um, in our home, so um, we had sort of the expectation that there might be a, a, a knock on the door. Any event, um, we were talking, I guess my, my daughter asked me at age two and a half, what had happened to Dalty? And this was the first time, you know, I had to confront with a young child, um, saying something about death. And so I, I knelt down, I was at the top of the steps. I knelt down. My, my wife was just a few feet away and I started to explain to my daughter that Dalty was not coming back. And this was somewhat emotional for me. Um, I felt my voice catching a little bit. And just at that moment, uh, we heard um, uh, a couple or three knocks on the door. Um, they were more like raps. It didn't quite sound like the, the girl we, we were expecting. And what I noticed was, and I have a good sense for, um, not for, for uh, sight of uh, things in vision, but for, for things that I hear. It sounded to me like the, the, the knocks were far down on the door, uh, like maybe uh, a couple of feet from the ground, which was strange. Anyway, uh, we were expecting this girl, and so um, uh, I bounded down the steps, opened the door, and there was no one there, um, which was puzzling. And, you know, I looked around, called my wife downstairs. Uh, we wondered if this were a prank. Um, it was not. Um, the girl actually didn't come over until, I think, a couple of hours later, uh, we didn't know precisely when she was going to come over, and uh, she said she had not come over uh, before. And uh, we thought, well, could we have squirrels running around the house? Could could a squirrel have bashed into the door? Could a squirrel be playing a practical joke? Anything like that? It was just out of the blue, witnessed by my wife. Uh, and it, what struck me, uh, Bernie, is this, this was part of a, an emotional situation, and it was just at the moment that really I was describing for my daughter what had happened in terms that I felt she could understand and feeling myself getting a little choked up. And that's when we heard um, these knocks on the door, which have yet to be explained. So um, I view that uh, maybe in a fanciful way as, as uh, Dalton uh, saying so long or saying that somehow he was present. Um, it's a pretty remarkable coincidence and something that's really not been duplicated. Uh, there, the connection between you and the emotion and the knock. Uh, you're, you're, you're suggesting there is uh, something perhaps causal there. What, what, do, you th what do you think uh, you're referring to? Yeah, I don't know. Causal or, you know, uh, Jung talks about a causal, you know, synchronicity is, as um, almost existing out of time in a sense. Um, I really, I don't know what to make of it, but I do like your, your concept of the psychosphere. Um, there's an animal doctor, um, a veterinarian by the name of Michael Fox, who has a syndicated column called the, the Animal Doctor. And he's come up with um, essentially the same concept. He calls it the empathosphere. And, you know, you've described it as sort of, you know, enveloping everyone um, who's alive. Um, just as we breathe out, uh, we exhale, we inhale nutrients. And, and uh, you know, that's the, the atmosphere that surrounds us and that we, we are immersed in without uh, typically being cognizant of it. I think you've described it in terms, and, and he has, uh, of, of um, uh, feeling as well, being suffused in the atmosphere. Yes. Uh, and I, I think that this is uh, perhaps the case, although we don't typically recognize it, but it's these outliers, these anomalies, these strange occurrences, uh, synchronicities, um, remarkable coincidences that uh, I think indicate that that may be, be the case. Uh, this more and more, I'm convinced that there is this uh, this e sea of uh, emotion uh, and ideas uh, floating around around us and through us. It's not a new idea, um, but it's a maybe sharpened an idea. And the difference, 
I have about it is that I'm just sticking here on Earth um, rather than trying to expand to the universe, which most people do. And I believe the psychosphere is an expansion step towards a, a larger uh, consciousness. But I, it's not complicated enough down here uh, to just stay with it. The, within the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, would you please comment on uh, the Snapper story of Snapper and I finding each other? Oh, I love that. And, you know, it's it's not unique. Uh, I, I like the sense that, I mean, what you said about his, his taking four right turns to, to reach you. There are stories um, that are legion, I suppose, that uh, talk about animals traversing great distances and... Um, uh, you know, enduring a lot of hardship um, cross country, you know, to, to get to back to their family. Uh, you know, so how how do they do that? Nobody really knows. But um, it could be that they're guided by, uh, you know, some sort of, of empathy or sympathy, some sort of connection within the empathosphere or the psychosphere uh, that leads them home. Um, and that's, you know, part of the reason that I, I like um, uh, studying animals and writing about them in my Psychology Today blog um, is that um, they live, in my estimation, closer to the bone. You know, they're not encumbered by the kind of, of language that, uh, you know, that we use on a daily basis and the rumination and the, the recollection and the mental gyrations that, uh, you know, is part and parcel of being human. Um, we take all that for granted and here we are conversing and we can talk about all kinds of higher concepts uh, but of course, while we're conversing, uh, you know, our, our bodies are doing what they do. And there's a, um, a great deal that's beneath the threshold of our consciousness, which is nonetheless, you know, it's, it's all about our life processes. And if we take a moment, you know, to, uh, to breathe, to, to kind of feel where we are, um, we're really situated, in, in my estimation, we're situated and anchored by feelings all the time. Um, you know, we might be feeling good, we might be feeling less good. Um, we're feeling something all the time, even though we may not be aware of it. It's a kind of, kind of a complex uh, palette of um, information that we're getting from uh, from our bodies, and and you know we're we're monitoring the the environment for threats and for opportunities and so forth, and that goes on all the time outside of awareness. And I think that animals, because they don't have the type of complex language, at least so far as we know. That, that we have as human beings, my sense is that they may um, uh, feel things more acutely. They may um, get information from the environment um, that's a little more difficult for us to come by just because we live at sort of a higher mental level and, and we, we're not so attuned to things in our bodies and um, connections with our environment uh, as, as animals may be. And the other interesting thing, of course, about um, animals, uh, mammals in particular, is how um, closely aligned they are physiologically and neurologically with human beings. They have all the same, you know, equipment as we do. Uh, it's just they don't have the some of the mental capacities that, that really um, we rely on through our neocortex. And um, uh, Darwin said that... Um, the variations among uh, among creatures are differences in degree rather than in kind, and that's certainly the case um, among mammals. And um, I think that we can learn a lot from uh, observing other mammals. And um, these these coincidences or remarkable situations that occur with our pets, in particular, you know, they're the animals, the mammals that we have the, the closest emotional ties to. And I think that says something important about how they are in the world and how we are, although we don't uh, always know it. That's beautiful. Um, I, they don't have uh, our, our prefrontal cortex uh, specifically uh, that we use to navigate in our worlds. But your your message is coming clear, uh, closer to the bone. I did not understand that phrase in your blog. Now I do. Uh, I, th I think you, I think it's more like uh, closer to the um, to emotional awareness, or not blocked by cognition is the more way I, I, I think about, or I think about it. Uh, the, not that they're not thinking because they they do that, um, but well, not, absolutely, not yeah, the way do. we do, not, not the way we do, and as well, much as we do, I mean. Yeah, they have their own processes. Each species, I'm sure, has, you know, unique attributes, but we have a lot of the same equipment. Yes, and, yes. Um, 
And yes. so when you know when a when a human being when someone says, "Oh, I feel it in my bones," you know, that is a, a, a phrase in language that you know. But they're trying to convey something that that is deeply felt that they don't need to cogitate a lot about. So that's yeah, how they come up with the phrase. I feel it in my bones, and I think there's a physical truth to that. Uh, I suspect that that's uh, really a lot of how animals go through their day. I think well, they we're feel coming a lot to the end of we'll come to the end of this segment, Michael, and we will be back talking about our pets in the next segment. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Hello, I'm Justina Marsh, and with my dad, Pete, we are going to present a new show called Too Good to Be True. Together, we are aiming to discover more truths about this world and beyond. Do you have unanswered questions about the world? Do you ever wonder about aliens, conspiracy theories, or the universe? There are many shows discussing subjects such as pyramids or UFOs, but we want to relay this information based on our own research, including from spiritual means. Hopefully, listeners will be helped with their own beliefs and will appreciate the psychic insights that add to the previous research and information. We both look forward to sharing this insight and beginning this journey with our listeners. Visit xzbn.net for more information about when to listen. Ancient prophecies, legends, and current events indicate we're entering a high-frequency era supporting enlightenment. During expansive times, old rules fail, necessitating access to the ever-shifting currents of life for guidance. There's an ancient form of shamanism through which we can obtain the information we need. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Art School, with a great new provision for those interested in spiritual evolution and personal empowerment. Galactic Shamanism, Art of the Ancients, Key to Tomorrow is an upcoming series of leading-edge online affordable classes designed to guide and support you and your family during these times of transition. Embrace the magic. Empower your life. Study Galactic Shamanism at findyourpathhome.com. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, 
Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome back to CC with BB. Connecting with coincidence with Dr. Bernie Beitman. Our guest today is Michael Jower, and we are talking about our pets. And Michael is making it clear to me, I hope to you, how our pets are not only just great companions and so many of them wonderful characters. It's amazing the characters and personalities some of these guys take on, but they also become a kind of laboratory for us to understand ourselves, to understand capacities that each of us has. In, in other words, to be able to pick up emotional information, to be sensitive to our environment through emotions the way our animals are. Now, Michael, I told you a story a little bit about Walter, uh, my son's dog, and how he made me, and certainly does it to Carlin, uh, make guilty about uh, leaving. Uh, could you tell us what, what you make out of that, please? Well, my experience um, is that uh, animals can communicate a lot through their eyes. Um, and, uh, you know, if we're sensitive to that, um, it, it's, it's just like reading people in, in, in different ways. But animals, I think, uh, especially our, our, our pets, seem to uh, be able to tell us things uh, through their eyes. And I had a remarkable experience with um, a cat named Persephone. Um, uh, a few years after uh, Dalton's passing, we became, um, oh, well, ultimately a dog family, but uh, in our latter stages of being a cat family, Persephone was um, a very sleek um, black cat. I would call her the Audrey Hepburn of cats. She was <laughs> very, very you, you, you make movie stars out of these guys. <laughs> she really was. Um, I could see her easily with George Pappard some, at some point, but... Um, so she, you know, she, um, she was very lithe, a uh, very smart cat. Um, uh, like you say that, you know, our, our, our animals have, have personalities, our pets do. And, um, um, she mm, sort of got her way, uh, whatever she wanted to do. She seemed to have her way in the world. And, uh, but uh, even I think more than Dalton, um, she was loving with not, not just with me, but with other uh, family members, uh, with my daughter in particular. Um, and uh, I remember um, Persephone had a, a, a stroke, uh, which set her back. She recovered, but um, um, she passed away. Um, I think within about two years of having had that initial stroke, and. Um, I'm pretty sure what felled her was a second stroke. And what I recall was one evening, and this was the day before she died, one evening um, I was walking down my driveway. I don't know if I was taking the trash down or just taking a stretch or something. And, and she would follow me around. It was, it was, it was very um, endearing. Uh, wherever I was in the yard, if I were uh, working outside, she would follow me around. And um, she had the loveliest purr. Um, and she would commune with me if we were outside. Um, on this occasion, I, I was just walking down the driveway, and um, I bent down to pet her, um, and she looked up at me with an expression of bewilderment. It, it was the darndest thing, Dr. B. Um, I, I haven't written about this, I don't believe, but um, I certainly spoke with my wife about it, um, it was an expression I'd never quite seen, and it was emanating from her eyes. And the question was something like, what is going on? Those were the words that, that occurred to me in my mind. And I uh, didn't know really how to react to that. It was just kind of odd. And I just, uh, you know, stroked her and tried to be reassuring. I really didn't know um, how to react to this or, or what this betokened. Um, in retrospect, uh, I think something was going on and she was communicating something. I, sh I think she was in some form of distress because the following day uh, a neighbor found her and she had passed away. And I believe it was a second stroke. And I think something was happening with her 
that she was puzzled about and she didn't know um, uh, what to make of it. And somehow I, I believe she communicated that to me. Beautiful. Beautiful. One of the, one, in one of your Psychology Today blog posts, uh, you mention uh, life-threatening emergencies uh, and how these emergencies can produce a distress signal. Uh, you saw it in Persephone's eyes, but I'm assuming this distress signal that you are referring to there has, can, can be transmitted over time or space. Yeah, I think there's something about emotion that fuses um, elements of our experience together that we, we typically, you know, mentally separate into, into different categories. And time and space, um, I think, really go together. Um, there's a, a chapter in my book um, that I devote entirely to, um, to time and trying to um, uh, figure that out a little bit. It's a very, very complex subject. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, there, I can't which, 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 which book is that, please, Michael? Uh, this is called The Spiritual Anatomy of Emotion. Um, and it's the first of my two books, and it, it delves into, well, there's a, a probably good part of a couple chapters that talk about pets. Um, but, and I, I'm trying to remember the, the philosopher who uh, brought this out, but uh, his conception is that time and space are, are always fused together. In other words, where you're sitting right now and talking to me and I'm sitting and talking to you and our listeners are sitting, listening to us is a time and a place. You know, their time and place is slightly different than our time and place. Right. And yet, you know, it's hard to conceive of something being either out of time or out of place. So, um, uh, you know, these dimensions of existence go together and there's something about emotion to me that the closer I examine it, uh, the more, uh, closely people are bonded or uh, people and animals are bonded or even animals and animals are bonded. I think there's something in the emotional connection that um, uh, allows convergences of time and space more readily. Uh, that may be the best way I can express it. Um, but I, I really think there's something in, um, in the emotion itself. I almost picture emotion as being uh, another binding force in the universe, along with, you know, the weak force and the strong force and different atomic <laughs> forces. I almost view emotion as either being suffused throughout existence or um, as a conduit for us to um, to get information about those closest to us. Um, you know, it may not be uh, it may be something startling, you know, like that that knock at the door that takes us unawares. Uh, it may be something that we're searching for is when you were searching for Snapper. Um, but I do think that the emotion is, is like I say, either a conduit uh, to information or it's, it's part of the fabric of, of existence itself. Could you talk a little bit more about how you conceptualize emotion being part of the fabric of existence itself? Uh, well, the, um, my first book, The Spiritual Anatomy of Emotion, the working title for it was called uh, The Emotional Gateway. And uh, my website is, is emotionalgateway.com. Um, and I, I guess I view uh, emotion as uh, simultaneously um, physical um, and, and mental and spiritual. I guess I, I view emotion as a connecting force within uh, ourselves, within each of us. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, our society in the West, at least, you know, we're fond of sort of separating mind and body which I think is unfortunate because mind and body are simply two sides of the same coin, uh, the way I view it. Um, but in any event, um, you know, we have this, um, this beneath consciousness part of ourselves, the bodily part that's, that's constantly um, breathing and processing, uh, digesting, uh, doing what it does. So um, that's the, the baseline feeling part of us. And that I'm sure has, you know, a correspondence in the, more primitive parts of the brain, the brainstem, and so forth. Um, and then you've also got emotional, uh, expressly emotional uh, uh, parts of the brain, the amygdala, the hippocampus, and so forth. Um, so there are, you know, parts of the brain uh, that that relate more clearly to emotion. But I guess I view um, feeling and the um, our ability to feel um, and express feelings. Um, as a connecting 
uh, force between our bodies, our minds, um, and our um, our spirituality, our sense of connection, uh, which is why I think animals have um, at least a rudimentary form of spirituality because they are connected with one another and with us in, in the same ways that we are with one another. They, they feel a lot of the same things that we do. They may feel other shades of feeling that we don't. Um, so I, I think that, again, um, emotion is, is not only a binding force within us as individuals, but I think it's something that you can look at uh, trans species uh, and see it at work. And I think that it underlies spirituality. Uh, because spirituality, to me, is at, at, at its most fundamental uh, a connectedness that we feel with with others that are close to us, and with with important ideas and awarenesses of of um, what life is about, and you know what what life might be about beyond what we know. How did uh, how did you get into being emotionally sensitive like this? It's not the usual thing guys do. <laughs> Well, I also enjoy football, <laughs> Major League Baseball right now, <laughs> and uh, a lot of good beers. So, um, and, and like, why is Dallas <laughs> losing so much? Yeah, okay. Uh, um, no, that uh, I definitely uh, women tend to be more aware of their feelings. Uh, I think than men. I think that's a given. There's there are a lot of differences in the female uh, brain uh, that have been demonstrated that uh, uh, women uh, have a greater you know, you know um, emotional intuition. They have greater intuition in general. I think um, they they are manifestly more sensitive to all kinds of things across the spectrum, and that's why women, incidentally, suffer from things like migraine headache and irritable bowel syndrome and and uh, chronic fatigue and chronic pain and so forth, uh, much more than men. I think it's something like three quarters of all of those populations are are women, more so than men. So there's definitely a more sensitive aspect to women. Um, but I don't know how I came about this. Um, not quite sure, except, um, I, I'm fascinated by how, uh, feelings work. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out how my own feelings worked. Yeah. Yeah. It's... <laughs> and I think in trying to understand that I've, I've become more attuned to it and, you know, consequently, uh, I'm fascinated by a whole range of things that I've, I've ended up writing about. The relationship between spirituality and emotion uh, is very an, interesting to me and intriguing. And the empathosphere, which uh, I think just covers a, the kind of emotional part of the psychosphere, not that we should divide them, we shouldn't, but I talk about um, information and energy. Uh, I, 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 emotion is an energy uh, that suffuses the psychosphere with, uh, with information in it, as I think about it. But the idea of, of calling it emotion and connecting our physiological uh, experience of emotion with what's going on in the psychosphere it, it intrigues me as you're thinking. And I wonder if you'd comment on helping me figure out the connection between emotion inside of me and emotion in the psychosphere. Well, I guess I can give you an, an example, uh, which some people would consider, you know, a coincidence. And, and um, but I think, I, I, I think maybe I think maybe we're going to have to wait till the next segment. Since oh, sure. We only have about 40 seconds left. But the eye, the, the, the sensitivity to emotion that you're describing and the primacy of emotion that you learn from looking at pets uh, is becoming a suggestion to our listeners to be able to tune into their pets so they can learn about some of the things that we're talking about. It's almost like uh, Jung's, uh, Jung's idea of a causal connecting principle through meaning would be more accurately said, a causal connecting principle through emotion. We will well, be I'll back. Very quickly. We, 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 just excuse me. We, we, have to stop here. we have to stop here. We'll be back after a short break. Hold on to that, please. All right. Earth is under ever-increasing pressure from untenable lifestyles and growing populations. Yet, viable answers seem in short supply. What if I told you there's an ancient form that can empower you to take charge of your life? What if your entire family could be enfolded and supported by life itself, finding safe passage through challenging times? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Art School with great news, an upcoming series of leading-edge online affordable classes based in an ancient form of shamanism easily learned and used by your entire family. 
Galactic Shamanism, Art of the Ancients, Key to Tomorrow are a series of online adult and children's lessons instructing your entire family on natural law, how to cooperate with and be supported by the powers of the universe. Visit findyourpathhome.com to find these unique and powerful classes. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Are you curious? Do you want to learn more about how the world works and have fun at the same time? Study coincidences with me, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, on my Connecting with Coincidence radio show here on the XZBN network. Listen to Jungians theorize, statisticians randomize, true believers evangelize while I categorize. I dance to the rhythm of coincidences. People who experience me see more of them. Maybe something on the show matches a thought in your mind. Let us know. Expand your mind to the weirdness happening around you. Synchronicity spoken here, there, and everywhere. For more information, put Connecting with Coincidence in your search engine and find my website, my social media sites, and my blog. is truth. Historically, we viewed things as either being true or false. Now as we enter a more expansive era, we find the question is not, is it true, but rather, how true is it? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of the Science of Magic Radio, a syndicated, internationally broadcast radio program dedicated to uncovering this ever-expanding truth. Join me daily on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, as I interview today's leading experts from the fields of science and magic to uncover the hidden truth between the lines drawn in the sand. What we unearth in our discussions is not only amazing, but totally unprecedented. You won't want to miss a single episode. In service to our listeners, past episodes can always be found on our website with our compliments at thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome back to CC with BB, Connecting with Coincidence with Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. That's me. Our guest today is Michael Jower, and we had to cut it off in the previous segment. And, Michael, please continue with what you were talking about, the the idea that an A-causal connecting principle could be emotion. I like that a lot better than the way Jung described it. What do you think? Well, I'm a fan of Jung myself, and uh, uh, when I spoke to the Jung Society of D.C. Uh, several years ago about this, uh, the woman who, who runs the organization, or did at the time, she was very nice. She came up to me afterwards, and she said, you know, if Jung were around today, he would be very interested in what you're bringing to our attention. He would want to explore that further, and I was very, um, not only really flattered by that, but I really meant something significant to me because I, I do think that it's at the core of, um, uh, you know, the sort of subject matter that he was vitally interested in. 
Um, and I do think that, uh, you know, emotion is something universal. I was going to say that, you know, all you need to do is open to any uh, current events web page, um, uh, Google News, MSN, um, New York Times, <laughs> you know, your, your, your local paper, wherever you may be, um, any magazine. And, you know, what you'll see is, is human behavior is almost entirely uh, driven by emotion, by, by feelings. Um, you know, the seven deadly sins, so many of them relate to excesses of emotion or uh, just misplaced um, uh, feelings. Uh, it, it's something that, um, you know, from a moral standpoint uh, is a challenge, but we're primarily emotional beings. You know, the, the mental part of us is, is kind of layered on top. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's just, it, it, it's what drives us as, as people. Um, and, um, it does connect us, um, uh, quite, I think, tangibly. Um, and, and that's probably, it, it comes out when you've got these, um, extraordinary situations. The, the one I was going to, uh, give you an example of is, I'm, so, I'm sorry, just, uh, I want to hear the example, but, yeah. uh, my, my question for you is Jung's a causal connecting principle. Uh, and he often wrote, and Jungians do, that emotion is involved with a lot of coincidences, but that emotion, as you're describing it, both from physiological and cognitive, from mental and also spiritual, that it's ubiquitous wherever we are, that's part of the psychosphere, that it becomes a, a, a better, clearer way of talking about a causality in, uh, Jung, in Jung's way. And that's what I'm asking, what you think of what I'm saying there. Oh, yeah. Well, um, maybe an analogy uh, that might be appropriate is is um, with money, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, you know, we, we tend to walk around with some amount of cash, uh, whether it's in the you know, form of, of actual cash or coins or credit cards when, when we're um, out in the world. Um, and, you know, we spend it um, or we save it uh, and it goes out into the world and we receive it as income. Uh, we invest it and so forth, divest uh, and so forth. And uh, I really, I think of emotion, um, uh, Bernie, as, as almost like a currency that we have. You know, some days we're flush with cash. You know, we, we feel up, we feel more energized. Other days uh, we're kind of feeling uh, lower. Um, we may feel depleted. Um, and um, I think you mentioned before about feelings, you know, emotion, the term, conveys uh, movement, emotion. And I think the Latin root of emotion is also, it has to do with, with movement from someplace to someplace. Yes. So it's, it's currency, it's stuff that's, that's, we, we have, it's part of us, but it's also moving. And when it's, um, uh, it's almost, uh, I, I would say almost like water. There's another analogy is that it, movement can be faster, can be slower. The energy of emotion can sort of uh, dam up, it could be pooled uh, in a particular place, um, stilted or stagnant, and it can, you know, can rush around madly. That's actually how uh, I think people in the Middle Ages in particular, well, during the Renaissance in particular in, in England, Shakespeare and his contemporaries conceived of emotion just that way. If you look at those plays that were done at that time, uh, they talk about mad passions and so forth. Um, they, they really pictured emotion uh, like water and like the weather, the tempest and so forth. I think that's accurate. I think that's really how emotion works. And when we talk about it being an a-causal connecting principle, it, it in my view, it flows. <laughs> it flows throughout the, the psychosphere. Uh, and I view it as a common currency uh, for us to get in touch at a, at a deep level, at a fundamental level uh, with people, even if we're not intending to. That's that's really good. And, um, and in uh, the ancient ways of dividing up the elements of reality, fire, water, air, and earth were uh, the dividing, at least in Western uh, concepts. Chinese added wood. Um, and water was always uh, the symbol of emotion. Uh, and now you're describing uh, really nicely for our audience the variability in water flow as analogous to the variability in emotion flow. And the, and the comparison to money uh, is interesting, too, because uh, 
people astrologically who are water and earth um, are more likely to get along with each other than uh, water with uh, fire or um, or air. Uh, so th these are th these are things coming together, but the specifics of your descriptions are beautiful. Now, please tell us the uh, the story that uh, you've been wanting to get to. Oh well, uh, it's it's about dreams. Um, uh, when people have, um, they can be called precognitive dreams or or um, telepathic dreams. You know, you you seem to get some sort of information from someone else uh, entirely. Uh, subconsciously, uh, that that uh, you know, upon awakening, you think, oh well, some, something might be going on here. Um, and the dream I wanted to relate is is a, a book that I um, read recently. Uh, it's by an Alaskan uh, writer, a photographer named Nick Jans, J A N S. The book is called A Wolf Called Romeo, and it's about um, a, a wolf that wandered into uh, his hometown of Juneau, Alaska. Um, around, I think, 2003. And remarkably, this wolf um, uh, formed uh, relationships with the, the residents of the city. He kind of made himself a fixture. People were fascinated by him. A wild wolf, um, a very imposing kind of creature, in good health. It wasn't looking for a handout. Um, it seemed to be looking for love or his companionship, which is why Nick Jan's wife dubbed the wolf Romeo. Uh, and and uh, uh, Romeo in particular seemed to like a number of the the, the Juno dogs, and he would hang out with <laughs> the dogs uh, and the female dogs in particular. Uh, and and one of those dogs dogs was named Brittany. Um, I'm sorry, Britain. Uh, and and Britain was described as Romeo's pseudo pseudo mate, love interest. And um, uh, Britain was owned by a, a friend of Nick Chan's named Harry Robinson. Um, who himself um, communed with with Romeo on the outskirts of town and, and got to know him very well, probably better than anybody else um, in the town over about six years until, unfortunately, Romeo was shot by some hunters um, and, um, ironically, from, from out of state. Um, in any event, um, in September 2009, Harry Robinson awoke from a nightmare, and um, he felt... Romeo scream. That was his phrase. I felt Romeo scream. Not I heard Romeo scream, but I felt Romeo scream. He said, I could hear it inside my head. He was in agony. I saw him turn to bite at his side. And at that moment, I knew he'd been shot. Uh, the next day, Romeo did not appear as usual to greet him and Britain, uh, nor did he over subsequent days. And interestingly enough, later, there was another guy uh, named Vic Walker, who's a local veterinarian. Uh, who knew Romeo in his own way, and he had a dream of Romeo being wounded, uh, not exactly the same dream. In his dream, the, the dog had been shot in the jaw, and the bone was totally shattered. But they, they found out years later that they'd had dreams approximately the same time. And uh, again, I, I, I look at this as, as kind of significant because uh, while not everybody who uh, was in touch with Romeo, who, who knew Romeo, uh, and embraced the, the wolf, um, you know, had these forebodings um, or these um, types of dreams. Um, uh, at least two people did. Uh, and again, you can view it as complete coincidence or you can you can look at it as, you know, it's, that is a, something completely random. Uh, but I think it's it's something other. I think it's a meaningful coincidence. Uh, I think it does speak to the connection that at least these two men had uh, with Romeo and um uh, it, it goes to show that you don't have to uh, have a, a, a pet physically in your house that's on a leash or has a collar around its neck. It can be a wild wolf, and you can form a relationship with a with a more wild creature. There's also a book, by the way, um, by a woman named Cy Montgomery called The Soul of an Octopus, and she, I think, it won a National Book Award a couple of years ago, and I've been in touch with her, and she, um, you know, she's demonstrated that you can feel some sort of a connection with a uh, with kind of a playful octopus. Uh, so, and that's not a mammal at all. So I think there's a lot out there to be learned and emotion is, I think the currency through which we can kind of fully appreciate how, how human beings are in the world. And, and we're certainly not unique. That's a very good story. So we're, we're coming to the end of this last segment. Is there anything else you'd like to say in the last 30 seconds? 
Uh, I could make some predictions on on um, uh, Major League Baseball playoff series, but um, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would truly be precognitive if I could do that accurately, but so far I haven't been able to. Okay, well, that will be the place that we end because um, what you've taught me is uh, that we can look at our animals and see connections among them between us and them in ways that uh, some people may not have considered. Uh, there's, there's, and the empathosphere is an important element in my conceptualization of how these things work. Michael, thank you very, very much for being on the program. 